Hi, today I want to just introduce fascism and talk a little bit about the intellectual origins of fascism and later on we'll be talking about the historical development uh, of it. Uh, first we have to just understand basically what it is and what it is not. Um, it's a misnomer to say that most fascists are quote far right uh, or ultra conservatives. The term fascist was used in the 1960s to describe the the so-called establishment or the more conservative elements in society uh, or you know people who are pro-Vietnam War. Um, but that's a misuse of the term really. Uh, fascists are uh, maybe what you might call reactionaries in the sense that they're reacting to something, um, but uh, they are not attempting to go back uh, to a more traditional time or place or to preserve old institutions uh, or to slow down change as a reactionary would. Um, rather, they're reacting to liberalism and socialism um, and they're doing so in a way that proposes new and different changes, really quite drastic changes. Um, fascists programs emphasize going forward with bold new ideas for society, breaking down old institutions and creating new and supposedly more authentic institutions for their society. So fascists propose very thorough going revolu revolutionary changes um, that can happen very quickly and that makes them neither reactionary or conservative. Um, the reason why they're associated with conservatism, if you want to go beyond the 1960s, is that like a conservative, they are reacting to liberalism and socialism. Just like um, uh, Edmund Burke was uh, critical of liberalism, so are fascists, although their criticism is quite different. At the general level, um, this opposition to liberalism and socialism emerges because both of those ideologies are universalizing ideologies. That is, that uh, liberalism and socialism both profess to apply to all people um, regardless of nation or race or any other characteristic that might divide people. Um, both ideologies are very egalitarian in their own way, trying to equalize people. Um, with liberalism, it's equal rights for all human beings, ultimately, and for socialism, it's equal property, which then gives equal power to every member of society. Now, the fascist dislikes egalitarianism uh, intensely and uh, does not believe that uh, all one size fits all or that any ideology can encompass all people because they believe that people are actually characterized um, by their nation, their race, their culture, uh, their religion, those things that, um, that make us different rather than anything that makes us similar. Um, in fact, fascists will go so far as to accuse ideologies such as liberalism and socialism of emasculating nation and culture, of, of uh, really um, destroying nation and culture to the detriment of um, a people. As I said, the fascist program tends to oppose conservatism as well because um, the conservative, like the Burkean conservative, wishes to disperse power or devolve power back to uh, lower levels in society to strengthen the institutions of family and, and such uh, institutions as the church, um, social organizations, the nobility. Um, dispersed power is good for the stability of society as far as the conservative is concerned. But the fascist wishes to concentrate power in the hands of a of the uh, very strong state, um, its government, but also its economy uh, and its social and cultural institutions should all be controlled by the very top echelons of the state. Um, and unlike a conservative such as Burke, the fascist desires a single party. There's no sense in having party competition. Um, that too weakens society. Now, fascism has deeper uh, roots. It has roots in the counter-enlightenment movement of the 19th century. You may remember that the enlightenment movement of the 18th century emphasized the power of human reason. Um, human reason could basically solve all of humanity's problems now that we had discovered more or less a scientific method for how to analyze uh, human behavior. We could propose changes and we could educate people such that they could solve some of the problems that had uh, plagued humankind before. 
Well, what is downplayed in the Enlightenment mentality? Well, exactly what the fascist wishes to play up. Um, rationalism, according to the fascist, ignores the power of spirit. Now, the Enlightenment thinker, maybe going a little bit overboard, called those things of the spirit superstition and prejudice and wish to, if not downplay them, maybe even eliminate them. Um, the Enlightenment thinker was very critical of religion as a, as a sort of form of superstition unless one rewrote it in a deistic framework, then it could become rational. Well, the fascist goes in the exact opposite direction and says that instead of reason being the fundamentally human characteristic, it is actually unreason, the spirit, the passion, the desire of people that is the fundamentally human characteristic. And that's why people need strong charismatic leadership, according to the fascist, because they, um, they are more spirit than reason, and they need to be uh, led by their passions and not by their reason. The fascist, as you'll find out, is very critical of this idea of enlightened self-interest, which, um, which makes a person selfish and unable to sacrifice themselves for the greater good. Okay, well, as you know, then, the Enlightenment tended to try to equalize human beings and to universalize them, saying that we're all rational beings and therefore we all have natural rights. And um, a pretty good example of this Enlightenment thinking, actually, is President George Bush's recent uh, comment, this is in 2004, um, in context of the I Iraq uh, situation and trying to bring democracy to Iraq, President Bush said, I believe all people want to be free. I believe if you give people a choice, they will want to vote and participate in their government. Well, that's a very universalizing statement, the idea that regardless of the fact that the Iraqis are Muslims and maybe have never really experienced anything like a democracy before in their culture, that they still uh, would prefer it and would thrive under it um, if they had a democracy. Well, fascists say this is a lie. Uh, that human beings are defined by their differences, as I've said, their differences including race, nationality, religion, and language, that they do not have all these things in common, uh, but actually they are quite discreet. Now, one of your readings is by a French diplomat and counter-enlightenment philosopher, Joseph Arthur de Gobineau. Um, whose dates are 1816 to 1882. He was a counter-enlightenment philosopher who wrote this essay on the in inequality of human races. Um, and as you read it, you may, you, and probably will, and rightly so, react with some revulsion because he states very in a very bald-faced way differences that he sees among the races. And, and it seems like a fairly simplistic way to us. Um, it was a way that was quite common at the time. Um, Joseph de Gobineau was not alone in making these kinds of observations by any means. And he was not a fascist himself, but this type of thought lent itself to later fascist thought. Well, he asked the question, what gives civilizations power and glory? Why do civilizations rise and fall? Well, instead of saying that they rise and fall on the basis of good quality leadership or the lack thereof, or um, having a, a talented population or not, instead de Gobineau places the blame and the praise on race, uh, in particular racial purity. A great civilization is one which is characterized by racial purity, whereas the fall of civilizations is caused by racial breakdown and racial mixing. So a people is defined by its race, according to de Gobineau, and we can understand peoples and behaviors by understanding their race. De Gobineau links race to uh, people's character and their intellect, and he makes the claim that not all people are equal or even potentially equal because human biology determines human beings' character and intellect. Now, de Gobineau uses the term blood, and what he means by blood is heredity. And in his view, heredity matters, and in fact, heredity is determining. Now, de Gobineau and others would have seen that 
um, you can breed in animals and that breeding has something to do with the characteristics of the next generation and he could also look around and see that characteristics are passed on from one generation to the next in human beings um, but the science of breeding uh, was not very far developed or not very well understood and and uh, we are light years ahead of, of anybody from his time as far as our understanding of, of human genetics but uh, de Gobineau believes that uh, interbreeding that is interbreeding of different races is generally harmful now he sort of says well if races breed uh, interbreed together um, it lifts out of mediocrity uh, the lower races as he sees it okay and because it it um, it mixes superior genes as we would say with those that are inferior and that does do good to those lower races however um, in de Gobineau's mind the um, tragedy of this is that the finest race which of course in his view is the white race um, is degraded by this mixture and uh, the most important thing is to preserve the white race which is the the one that in his view is superior to all others because in his view it is the bearer of all civilization so you can see just how um, in, in a way simple this is and self-serving this is that um, but taken very seriously by people at the time these types of arguments de Gobineau says at the end of his essay or near the end he says if mixtures of blood are to a certain extent beneficial to the mass of mankind if they raise and ennoble it this is merely at the expense of mankind itself which is stunted abased enervated humiliated in the persons of its noblest sons even if we admit that there is that it is better to turn a myriad of degraded beings into mediocre men than to preserve the race of princes whose blood is adulterated and impoverished by being made to suffer this dishonorable change yet there is the still the unfortunate fact that the change does not stop here for when the mediocre men are once created at the expense of the greater they combine with other mediocrities and from such unions which grow ever more and more degraded is born a confusion which like that of babel ends in utter impotence and leads societies down to the abyss of nothingness whence no power on earth can rescue them well that's a pretty dismal view and and uh, uh, not nice at all of course um, and some of my students reacted in class to this by basically looking ill um, but we have to understand again that this was not an unusual view at this time and people from all sorts of political positions were taking this view in Gobineau's view there are three primary races and those are the white the yellow and the black races and they create various other hues by their mixing red brown and etc for de Gobineau, physical attributes are very important for understanding intelligence and quality and he thought that he was reflecting basically the um, cutting edge of science uh, at the time what we would call the beginning of anthropology by discussing these things at this time it was quite common for races to be um, examined and, and cataloged by such things as skull size and shape um, with the idea that the skull size or shape or both would determine the level of intelligence uh, of a people also he characterized people peoples by their vigor and strength or lack thereof by their appetites whether they were strong or dull and by their senses whether they were uh, very sensitive they had dull senses or basically non-existent senses well the idea there was that um, you know the white race was more vigorous and strong and actually that it had duller senses um, which led it to be stronger less less um, sensitive to pain um, able to work longer and so forth the white race is je definitely on top of course according to de Gobineau and he praises it for having quote energetic intelligence and an extreme love of liberty um, he says that the white race is moved by honor and that this uh, motivation of honor is unknown to the other two races so 
de Gobineau's goal, of course, is for purity of the white race. And interestingly, um, he puts this in terms of for the good of the entire world, we have to preserve the purity of the white race. Unlike future fascists, de Gobineau wasn't interested in stamping out everyone else, but rather he was interested in the white race continuing to be pure so that it could continue to elevate mankind and lead it. Um, he did advocate separateness because he didn't want that mixing, but he wasn't about uh, trying to destroy everybody else. There wasn't this um, total visceral hatred of other people in, in his thought. Well, now let's think about biological determinism generally, because uh, de Gobineau and others of his kind are definitely biological determinists. They believe that biology determines all the other human characteristics. Well, certainly we can see that around the world there are differences among people. There are differences in the way they look. There are differences in culture um, and certainly differences in level of development. And um, actually these differences in levels of development, the um, somebody like de Gobineau or a fascist would look at and say, well, there's proof that different races are not equal because they haven't equally developed. Well, are all these differences caused by genetic factors or biology? Well, that's a, a good question. It's certainly one that we don't know the total answer to, but we do know that genetics is, uh, is not determining to everything that a human being becomes. Um, as a student in class pointed out today, um, two very highly intelligent parents can still produce a child that has academic problems or um, social and behavioral problems. And likewise, two parents who never achieved any education and perhaps are not very uh, bright may yet produce a, uh, a child who goes on and gets a PhD in astrophysics. These things happen. So we know that genetics is not the only factor and that uh, environment matters a great deal and that people are born with different talents and abilities, um, some of which are unrelated to previous generations. So. There's a mixture, apparently, between what we inherit and um, what we do that, and what we, what we have around us that influences us. Now, the Enlightenment answer to de Gobineau would be, in fact, that man is affected more by the structure around him than he is by his biological characteristics. You can really change people a lot by changing the environment that they're in by changing, in particular, the government that they have, because the government tends to influence all else and, and influences the education system, influences the culture, uh, whether it uh, you know honors learning and advancement or not, influences religion. Um, and you know, on all these things, the government can either encourage progress or discourage it. And the Enlightenment philosopher basically blames stupid, ignorant governments uh, for the um, for the downfall of, of civilizations and for the backwardness of certain people. And if you replace those governments with good government, i.e. government that respects human rights um, and gives people a stake in, in their um, governance and, and also gives them an education, then things will change. So for the Enlightenment philosopher, the problem is ignorance. And the solution is education. And, and those things only happen if you have an enlightened government that makes those things happen. But, and here's a caveat before we praise the Enlightenment thinkers too much, at the time they were writing in the 18th century, um, they too wrote of different races as inferior to the white race. In particular, they looked at Africans, and many of them um, um, treated African race as though it were um, as though it were inferior to others. Uh, also, in many cases, these thinkers um, treated Jewish people as though um, all of the stereotypical characteristics that have been applied were true. Um, women also were left out of, of their calculation. And we're talking about thinkers such as Montesquieu, um, one of the philosophers that is um, very influential in the American founding, but yet he looked at um, some of the people around the world and he basically blamed climate and geographical conditions. He had a theory that uh, that people who lived in hotter climates were not as energetic uh, 
were not as suited for liberty, were not as capable of self-governance as those who lived in the northern and better climates. Um, John Stuart Mill sort of bucked this trend in his book, Subjugation of Women, um, went, but he took on theories that were very prevalent in his, in his time, that women's nature was very different from men because their brains were smaller, their bodies were smaller, they were more highly emotional because of their biological nature and so forth. Um, Thomas Paine was anti-Semitic. Um, he made statements about Jews that certainly were just as anti-Semitic as anything that you would hear uh, in the 20th century. Uh, Alexis de Tocqueville also had theories about races and their geographic and climatic conditions. Um, so we have to keep in mind that everybody, and I mean everybody, in the 18th and 19th century, even the top-notch uh, intellectuals of the day, uh, took these types of theories seriously, felt comfortable making general stereotypical um, uh, statements about Africans and Jews and women and so forth. Uh, so with that in mind, I think it's it's more understandable how um, in the 20th century fascist thought could develop and Nazi thought because um, those those ideologies built on very deep resentment, very deep prejudices, um, very simplistic ways of thinking about races, and a sort of knee-jerk um, uh, notion that the European uh, represents the um, the peak of of human civilization. Okay, well, I want to look very briefly at some of the elements that combine to form actual fascist thought. Um, first, nationalism. Now, nationalism uh, as an idea can can be seen as early as the 16th century in Machiavelli's thought, when Machiavelli urges the unification of the Italian people into one nation state united by language and culture. It gets its uh, gets more tracks, more traction, I should say, during the uh, period of the French Revolution and uh, the Napo Napoleonic conquests in Europe um, with the idea of the French nation um, and its destiny. Um, also, um, von Bismarck's unification of the Germanies in the 19th century represents this uh, notion of of nationalism in Germany. The idea is that the nation is what characterizes a people. The nationality of a people is what should unify them. Their states should not be multinational or multi-ethnic, but should should unify one nation. Um, and this notion, um, in its stronger forms, denies individualism as the primary human experience and instead emphasizes identity with the group or nation as the highest form of human experience. Well, it's, there's no denying that nation can give people meaning, and people who believe that their nationality matters are not fascists, and this is one thing I want to make perfectly clear. Just because people feel pride and belonging in their nationality is not a danger sign of, of uh, fascism or Nazism, but there's a point beyond which it becomes extreme enough that you can say that it's dangerous. And uh, this is when people totally subsume their individualism to the nation, and when the nation becomes sort of a symbolic thing, a religion almost that um, that uh, unifies them and and um, and makes them want to dominate others. Uh, that's when you get something more characteristic of fascism. Another element of uh, fascist thought is elitism, which developed in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, now, usually when we use the term elite, we use it in a sort of derogatory way. You know, the elite media or elites in business are controlling uh, too much of our campaigns and, and so on. <clears throat> but uh, for these thinkers, elitism is a good thing, and it's, it's absolutely true. Uh, human associations, they say, always form elite leaderships. Well, this this is true when you think about it. It's very rare to find a group of people getting together for some purpose that haven't selected a few people or maybe even one person to lead the way. It's sort of a, a natural human tendency. Um, Robert Michaels, a Swiss sociologist, um, 
from the early part of the 20th century, looked actually at European socialist parties and thought, well, if you can, if you could find sort of group leadership anywhere where everybody is, you know, a part of a process, it would be in a socialist party. But what he found is the uh, European socialist parties formed elites too, just like everybody else. Um, and he is the one who came up with the, coined the term, the iron law of oligarchy. Um, to him, it was an iron law, a steadfast truth, that uh, people will always form elites or oligarchies um, within whatever organization they have. Well, for a fascist thinker, this idea, um, again, is sort of made stronger or more extreme. Um, and the idea that we shouldn't try to devolve power or bring more power back to people or spread it out and fight against this uh, tendency for people to form elites, but rather we should uh, actually take full advantage of this because the elites are indeed superior to the common people and they should rule. They have more of a right to rule. Um, now, again, neither of these two ideas in themselves are fascist, but but when they're taken to this extreme, they become a characteristic of fascist thought. Okay. Um, next, we have irrationalism. Uh, that's the third element. Now, this more than anything else is the essential ingredient of fascist and Nazi thought. It developed in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, um, and these are th many theories that emphasized our non-rational side. Um, we can think of Freud, um, Sigmund Freud, the great uh, psychologist, pioneer of the unconscious in the early, th early 20th century. Um, his theory was that early infant and childhood experiences greatly influence our adult psyche, but that we, we no longer remember what those are. Um, he theorized that our erotic or sexual impulse high um, can account for much of what we do in life. Um, unhealthy treatment of this impulse, according to Freud, can lead to neurosis, as he put it, or psychosis. And so he spent a lot of time trying to uncover um, those early childhood experiences for people so that they could stop being repressed and, and, um, and uh, get rid of these psycho psychological problems. Alfred Adler um, is another psychologist from the early 20th century, an Austrian psychologist, who believe that feelings of inferiority can lead to strong desires for power and that uh, people pursue power and control in this way sort of unconsciously um, because of their feelings of inferiority. And finally, Carl Jung uh, was a 20th century Swiss psychologist who believed in these unconscious archetypes uh, buried deep in the human psyche uh, that had been expressed through religion for uh, centuries and millennia, uh, but in the modern, more rational society were suppressed in their expression. And so he theorized that they were seeking a new home, that the human psyche had to have a place to place these or externalize these archetypes, and it was doing so for the first time in these modern mass ideologies. So actually, he warned of mass movements such as Nazism and fa fascism in the 20s and, and early 30s. And after the war, he wrote about it again in the 50s and 60s and explained Nazism and communism as well in terms of the mass hysteria of suppressed un unconscious archetypes. Okay, so those are three um, aspects of fascist thought that combine and used uh, in, in a way that is harmful became um, or lent themselves to the fascist and Nazi movements. With irrationalism, well, Adolf Hitler, for instance, said the masses are irrational and they need to be led uh, by, by uh, somebody who can harness the, their passion and their, their, um, you know, their emotions. Um, and that this is a good thing and, and not something to try to get over as Carl Jung thought. Okay.